Three, two, one. Oh, no. Yes! We go like ever. I look like a picnic table or a pic, uh, you know. Table 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 table. Table. Oh, you got polka dots on. Yeah, we got our patterns. Yeah, we did Courtney. I got a shirt just like that. Perfect. <laughs> Everyone know Rachel? Hi. Rachel, you want to introduce yourself and Hello. tell them a little bit about you yeah, and why we call you the open house expert? <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, I'm Rachel Harms. I'm out of the West Des Moines office. Um, I am partners with Brandon Patterson um, at Home DSM, and we started um, over five years ago now with OO. It's gone fast. Oh, that's crazy. Five years, that's gone by fast. It has gone fast, but... Yeah, we do a lot of open houses between um, existing and then new construction a lot. So we've kind of tried a lot of different things and kind of figured out some things that work and what doesn't work and how to go about it. So we're excited to share those with you today. She has great tips. So I first met Rachel. What year did I first meet you? Mm. I was in college. So that was like two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Is a while more than that, about 10 years ago. Ten, yeah, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I first met Rachel through her parents. So I was helping her parents, uh, Bill and Kelly, find a home. And then on the weekends, uh, Rachel would ride with us. And she was just kind of this little squeaky clean little uh, oh. college girl. She was, well, as in appearance, she was, <laughs> she was also in a sorority. Wow. And yeah. She was also in a sorority, and I could tell the days when she was hung over yeah. when we were <laughs> out looking. Because we looked at houses for a while, and she would sit in the back of my car. So we had uh, Bill, my brother. Kelly, uh, Rachel, and Austin. Um, and, uh, and at that time, I was like, you know, just a younger, newer agent showing yeah. their uh, parents a house. And then, like, two years later, Rachel calls me and says, I want, I, met someone. <laughs> I want to buy a house. Yeah. I'm like, Rachel, weren't you just in college? Like, and you had graduated and met somebody. And so she had the best real estate agent ever, me, helping her. And I'd like That's to true. make the claim to fame that because of my excellence, she decided to become a real estate agent. Yeah. <laughs> and then haven't looked back. Yeah. Five yeah. Years Five years later. So. And the reason why we have Rachel here is they do a lot of open houses, um, and that's definitely a very strong lead generation pillar for them. I mean, I know you guys do a lot of uh, how how often um, a year or a month are, are you and Brandon doing open houses? Um, this year we've done fewer open houses, just been more like working by referral. Um, but previous years, I mean, it was almost every weekend between the. You know, if not both of us, one of us at least would be out doing an open house. So mm -hmm. we did first couple of years we were out every weekend doing open houses with our either each other or our spouses. Yeah. Right out with us. Yeah, and then Rachel, um, maybe a handful of times a year would do dreamscape open houses for mm -hmm. us. And um, so how I know she's awesome is when she does the dreamscape open houses. So those have led to, at least the ones that I know of, right. quite a few customs that um, have built with us, and I'm sure clients that have built or bought somewhere else. Yep, we've done uh, probably, th I think we're trying to count like three or four custom homes of clients that we've picked up through like doing a um, builder open house. Um, mm -hmm. Dreamscape's a great one to get um, to meet clients with. I mean, everybody always loves Dreamscape houses, so it's pretty easy um, to do that, but yeah, just reaching out to different builders and things are a great way to. Yeah. If you don't have inventory, to at least go sit in an open house, um, especially if it's in a great location. Obviously, people. And, and all those people that they brought to us that we built custom homes, they were brand new people, strangers that you guys had never right. met before. Right. Yeah. So, so that's why Rachel's here. Yeah. Wealth of knowledge. But how many? Uh, just a quick show of hands. How many people? Are doing open houses pretty routinely, Andrew. Yeah. So we'll get you in the cycle too, and we've got a handout. You guys have awesome videos for your yeah. Houses. Yeah. We're trying. You know, I will tell you the star of the videos. The Cameron. Is Cameron. I know he. Those toe touches are. The toe touches. Are. <laughs> I would have pay big. I my angle just go snappy and yeah. I do one. I would pay big money to see you do something physically amazing. 
Yeah. All right, I'll try. It's like break dancing I'll work on my head. Did you try uh, that? All right. Yeah. All right. So I was in the back bend, like do it upside down. You guys, you guys. Bridges. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Dancing. I was gonna say that's what I'm gonna try working on. Well, maybe the three of you guys <laughs> some people should do like, it, like it. you guys all know what the, what the Eskimo roll is. Maybe the three of you guys could do an Eskimo roll. There we go. And then, yeah. but the key thing with <laughs> the Eskimo <laughs> roll, the Zach is small. I don't like flatten. Or maybe thing. we'll purposely do that just to make the video. Or right. you guys could just do a pyramid if there's three of you. There we go. Okay. Oh, you know what? Like Stick that. with that cheerleading theme, <laughs> and then yeah. you know maybe Zach can. Hey, yes, I like that. I'm gonna know. write that down. See, look, he's getting ideas already. Yeah. Is, yeah. <laughs> okay. So everyone got a handout. We're gonna go ahead and just go through the handout. We're gonna go through the slides, and something happened uh, with the TV. Did uh, I uh, Oh. Needs to be woken up. Woken up. Okay. There we go. There we go. There's a quick one. <laughs> so, oh, thank you. So the the first handout that we gave are um, some numbers mm -hmm. and um, financial consequences of not doing open houses, and uh, they are three columns. So the first column is being consistent at open houses. The second column is not only just being consistent at open houses, but being efficient which I know all of you guys in this room are at that efficient level. And then the third column is being proficient. And for me, prof proficiency is something that we always try to get better and better at. You know, sometimes when you think you're really good, you know, what else can you do to just continue to strive for that excellence? And just be <coughs> really awesome what you do. But so let's say, for instance, that you do 45 open houses a year. So you take seven weeks off. Um, that would give you a total of uh 45 opens for that year and let's say the average walkthrough which rachel um this is pretty close to your average for you and brandon right i know you guys have had bigger weeks as well mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of bigger weeks but let's say on average you get five groups that walk through not people because sometimes you know a husband and wife or a boyfriend and girlfriend come together so you get five groups that walk through so that means you talk to a total of 450 people and the set rate is just a, a, a rate at which you can convert people into appointments. So if you're consistently doing open houses, um, you know, you might get 10%. If you're efficient and you've got good dialogue, good people skills, good rapport, relationship building skills, 15%. And then as you improve on those skills, all of a sudden you're at 20 plus percent. And then what that means is that you'll have anywhere from 45 to 68 to 90 appointments based on the average of five groups that come through your open house, which leads to meetings of 23, 41, 63. And then from a conversion rate standpoint, again, the consistency to the proficiency, anywhere from 45 to 55 to 65 percent, leading to anywhere from 10 closings, 23 closings, up to 41 closings um, per year just by being proficient at open houses by really committing and, and focusing on using open houses as a strong lead generation pillar. And then let's take an average gross commission income and we're basing this off of a $200,000 house, 3%. So if you're grossing about 6,000 per closing, if you're consistently doing open houses, that's 60 grand that you'll add to your bottom line. Efficient, 138. Proficient, 246. Does that sound like pretty impressive numbers broken down? Does that motivate anyone in this room to yeah. get excited about open houses? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and this is the thing is, you know, when we show you these numbers, sometimes we go, like, oh, yeah, whatever, you know. But it's it's one thing to just see numbers, but it's another thing to really believe and live by working by numbers because if you really believe in these numbers, then you can achieve these numbers. I'm a hundred. You guys kind of have a lot of you guys have been in my training, and I'm a big believer of uh, thinking, believing, achieving. So we've already helped you think these numbers out. But if you can believe in these numbers, there's no reason why you can't achieve them, Randy. Are these kind of like national numbers, or are these kind of like just general? Throughout the these industry are industry, or yeah, these are uh, industry numbers, but these are uh, definitely. Uh, dialed into our local numbers. I mean, these are, you know, actually pretty basic numbers as far as, you know, the weeks of, that you do open houses, the averages. I don't know, can you guys kind of agree or disagree on the average groups when you guys are doing open houses? Andrew, how many are you getting on average through? Well, I'm doing Saturdays and Sundays. Mm -hmm. And on Sundays, I'm getting 
four to five groups and then Saturdays it's like two to three groups. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's still, I mean, yeah, whatever way you get more groups through is, yeah. Well, and I think part of it depends too on like how many days the home's been on the market versus the location. Um, and the then obviously mm -hmm. Saturdays, I know our top, like you just mentioned this too, like football is on right now, you know, like things might be a little slower around mm -hmm. the holidays. That yeah. weather. Those effects. are the serious people that are out right. on yeah. Saturdays. Yeah. I love those people. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I would say too, if, if you do a price, if you're gonna do a price reduction, do that on like a Monday or Tuesday and get that open house set up, and I see a spike mm -hmm. whenever I can throw something in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It ices it a little. Yeah. Bit. And we're gonna talk about a lot of those things uh, from a logistical, tactical standpoint. But to answer your question, Randy, so these are industry numbers backed up by local numbers, backed up by broker and agent experience numbers. And conversion rate, um, you know, strangers in general, if you get an internet lead, you might be one in 25, right, Andrew? Mm -hmm. um, open house, you know, back to being proficient, one, you know, 10% out of five, you know, a half a buyer, 15%, uh, 20%, that's one buyer. So those are pretty good, solid numbers. And so there's definitely things that we're going to talk about later on in some of these uh, following sections about how to help you increase your conversion rate. So, anything else on the numbers? But really, I, I mean, these aren't BS numbers. I really want you guys to, to believe in these numbers, visualize seeing yourself hitting these numbers because um, I think if you create and focus on open houses as a, as a lead generation tool, um, you'll, you'll definitely see, see the results. So the next slide is the no, do, and ha have of open houses going from prospect to open house and then labeling the looker method, just identifying of the two to three that Andrew's getting on Saturdays, of the four to seven that he's getting on Sundays, you know, how do we identify who's a buyer versus who's a tire picker, who's that nosy neighbor that wants to just kind of peek in on their, their neighbor's, you know, personal space. And then knowing the things that we're going to talk about and the things that you guys have in your handout, you know, we've got a welcome dialogue, we've got a labeling dialogue, we've got some follow-up, and some justification stuff. And then these lists of things are the things that we want you to have for open houses. Uh, your call lists, so people that are signing up, how you follow up with them, having directional signs. Um, everyone in this room have directional signs, a, a lot of them. I think that's something that um, is pretty important, just having as many flags and as many signs as possible, directional signs. But one thing we were talking and joking about yesterday, maybe I'm joking about more so annoyed about is just be careful with cities and, and how many signs My husband, you can put up. every time he puts signs up, so a neighbor comes out and tells him to take them down. So be careful if you're putting them up yeah. on like corner lots especially. I mean, people can be. Yeah. Well, and, and the one thing we talked about this too, and some, an idea that I have for you guys, and this is something that I did, is knock on their door, you know, and or, or have like a pre-made uh, postcard or a door knocker and say, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, just wanted to ask you if it was okay. I'm trying to sell your neighbor's house down the street. We're trying to drive traffic. The house is just got on the market. We're real excited about the open house. Or or maybe this house has been on the market for you know three months. We just had a price drop, and so we're trying to do everything we can. Is it okay if we put a sign in the corner? I'll, I'll, I'll put it up on Wednesday, or I'll put it up to, I'm going to put it up today. I'll, I promise I'll take it down by Sunday. So Andrew Bruin does this, and he knocks on my door. And I'm like, hey, that's a nice guy, you know. Mm -hmm. He's handsome. He's rugged looking. We even a business he's, card. Man. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what I was saying too. Is like if he had some a business card or a handwritten note or a, even a door knocker, or even you say, you know what, for me to rent your corner here, here's a five dollar gift card to Starbucks or to Subway. It's another reason to knock on a door. Also invite them, right? Say, hey, I'm, I'm just going to be right around the corner. Um, we're going to have, you know, fresh baked apple pies or fresh baked cookies, lemonade, bring the kids through. We're just going to talk about some mega open house ideas too. So definitely there are ways to combat that. And I think, you know, if, if it was my corner lot and all of a sudden I see a, a, a directional sign, would I be annoyed? 50-50. And that's me being a nice guy. But, you know, most people, I probably say 80% are annoyed and 20% don't care. So to o overcome that and maybe add someone into your database, not how to do it. And give them a little thank you. Um, you just gave me an idea that, like, I have, you guys know my plagued Norwalk house that I've had 
six or seven open houses for now. Mm -hmm. So I've used those corners a lot. And I, I think I'm just gonna go up and like give them a thank you for what I mean. You should definitely Because like, I haven't said anything to them yet, you know? This is gonna be the Bible for you, Lindsay, I think on open houses. Yeah. Well, I think like the bigger thing too with neighbors are the flags, um, because I know like if you go up your station, you wanna like make sure you're not driving your, like a directional is gonna just sit on top of the, the lawn, but the flags, I think people get more upset about. Yeah. So I mean, that, like if you're doing the flags, I would definitely ask. Yeah, and what I would say is that the directional tents um, are cool just because they're not going to mess up their yard, right? And then if you got flags, like I know the tourist teams have a lot of bags, mm -hmm. and home has a lot of bags, put those in your yard. In front of the house. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, um, sign-in sheets, and we're, we've got a really cool sign-in sheets, uh, guest register that we're going to show you guys, a home criteria sheet, we've got that, um, clipboard. Um, <laughs> you don't need a clipboard. We kind of joked about that, but it's, you know, whatever. Um, MLS printout of the house, uh, tax information, uh, pricing tools, and then thank you notes. So again, list of the things that you need to know to be prepared for open houses, and then these are a list of things that you should definitely have for every open house. Okay. And before we get too deep into open house, this is just a summary of some of our core entrepreneurial beliefs. And we're not going to go through all of them, but I do want to highlight a couple things just from a mindset standpoint. Number three, the market does not and will not determine your income. So that's the one thing. Right now, the market is great, right? I shouldn't say great. It's pretty solid. Not only you and I sat down and looked at the, uh, what you say? <laughs> Sucks. Sucks. Um, you know, and that's the thing is all markets are different. So Norwalk resale 240, what do you got? 250, 250, that's a tough market. That's what we're finding, right? Melanie, when we did the, uh, we did the uh, Ankeny new construction open house uh, or new construction market, how many houses between, this was just ranches between 300 and 400 in Ankeny, it was like 100, wasn't it? Something. Right, it was over. Yeah, those yeah. were crazy. For just ranches. I know that um, Mark Tarter just posted on, I don't know if you guys all follow Central Iowa. Yeah, I saw. There's like 450 plus homes in Ankeny listed right now. For sale? Yeah. Yeah. And there's 400 in like all of the Des Moines, like Northwest. So you know what's like, great? On the list side, not so great. On the buy side, guess what? I'm going to get you a heck of a deal. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. so that is, there is a shift. I'm glad you guys brought that up. There is a shift because we've been in a buy, uh, a seller's market, I'm sorry, for the last, probably since Rachel's been an agent, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we've been in It's been a couple years, probably. Yeah. yeah. Now it is shifting. So depending on the market that you're in, is it a buyer's market? Is it a seller's market? It all depends on months of inventory. I know Lance has talked about this. We've talked about this, you know, figuring out absorption rate. So when you do absorption rate, which we could definitely go over um, at another time, you know, you look at the months of inventory. And if you're right at six months, that's equilibrium. It's not a buyer's market. It's not a seller's market. But if you go above uh, six months of inventory, that's when it becomes a buyer's market. There's more supply than there is demand. And then when you go below, which we've been below that, and still are in certain price points, like maybe 150,000 in West Moines is, is definitely below that. That's definitely a seller's market. So that's definitely uh, things to think about. But at the end of the day, what I'm getting at is the market does not and will not turn your income. I need you guys to really believe in that. When the bo market bottomed out in 2010, which I felt was the bottom, maybe I'm off by a few dozen homes, but I remember seeing like, um, still like a 800 houses pending the month of August, then I thought to myself, you know, am I good enough to get at least 1%? Well, 1% of 800 is eight pending transactions. And who in this room wouldn't love to write eight deals in one month? And so that's just getting 1%, get half a percent of the bottom of that market. That's still four deals. And four deals times 12 months, I mean, that's a great year. That's double what our average agent does. So that's the mindset that I really want you guys to have is I don't care what the market's like. It's a seller's market, a buyer's market. If you create value, you create systems, have the tools and the resources, have the right brokerage behind you guys, you guys would be A-OK. -okay. I've been in business for 11 years now, and I've always had plenty of food to put in my belly. So another one I want to go over seven. Success stems from uh, 
Drupal processes and systems. So open house, we definitely want you guys to believe in the system uh, or believe in the, believe in it as a lead generation pillar, but we also want you to make it a system. You shouldn't have to reinvent the wheel every weekend that you're doing open house. The only thing that really should change is which house you're holding open. Everything else from the way you market it to the signage to the sign-in sheet to the follow-up should definitely be a, a textbook checklist system. And then number eight, it's unacceptable for my business to earn zero. The cool thing about concepts are average agents doing 24 transactions, doing very well as far as gross commission, but if you're kind of hovering around that zero week to week, month to month, that's one reason why you should add open houses to your, your portfolio of, of uh, pillars. Um, but these, I love all these entrepreneurial beliefs. And then the next one, uh, real estate sales belief, the, 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 the ones I really want to focus on with you guys today is four. I will not convert 100% of the leads I do not generate. So back to the conversion rates of being proficient to efficient, uh, or efficient to proficient. And then also number five, people will trust and follow what I can logically and tab tangibly explain. So we do have some scripts and some dialogue, some things to talk to because you can hold the perfect open house in the perfect area and have the, the most people come through your open house. But if you're not able to um, transmit that trust and being able to explain things and get people excited to work with you as an agent, that's a skill set that we definitely want to help you with. Okay. Um, and then buyers. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about the benefits of open houses for a sellers, but at the end of the day, you know, there's a one in 3,000 chance that that listing might be the one for them or a one in 400 chance, right? So the so in a perfect world, you pick up that buyer and you sell them the house. And if it's your listing, you're getting full size commission. That definitely happens. Um, I don't think it's like a 100% thing, it's probably not a 50% thing, it's probably not even a 25% thing. So it definitely happens, but the underlying goal too is to pick them up as a buyer. So buyer beliefs that we want to help you guys with is number two is real good. Uh, motivated, qualified, and loyal people buy homes. If you're sitting down with people and they're not motivated, they're not qualified, and they're not loyal, any one of these three, don't work with them. Especially if they're not loyal, you know they can be motivated to buy. They can be qualified, but if they're not loyal, they go to Andrews Open House. You know, yeah, we'll work with Andrews. Send us every listing you have and schedule these showings on Monday. And then they're gonna say, Oh, Melly, that's on Wednesday. Let's go and look at these houses. Not loyal, right? And obviously, they need to be qualified. So number two is important. Number three, having a process reduces the risk that comes with buyers. I know we've done buyer. Um, momentums and masterminds. So definitely having a buyer uh, process is important. And then if they won't meet you, they're not a buyer. So CTOK, if they're not coming into the office to meet with you, they're not people that you probably want to work with. Um, it doesn't mean they don't meet, they you know, come in the office. They just need to meet you somewhere, whether it's at the office or at a house. That could be your buyer's presentation at the house or at a coffee shop or at a bar. Right? You know when you meet clients at a bar? Uh, that is a happened. Yeah, happened. Yeah. 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 You know, um, you know, I, I'm a big, you know, proponent of that. I mean, not getting them drunk, of course. You know, I think there's legal and ethical things there, but you know, I just, think you and I met at. Well, what was it? I forget. Oh, big shot. Oh, big shot. <laughs> it just makes it for a social setting, and if you're not utilizing local cool places to meet clients instead of meeting them in a conference room or meeting them in the house, taking them out, buying them a, a drink and an appetizer, talking business over a meal. I mean, I think that's a, a huge leverage tool that you can utilize. So, it's before noon, I would suggest a coffee. Yeah, yeah. And then A, this is the most important part of that one, A, buyers deserve my immediate time. Anyone have any questions on that? Pretty straightforward stuff. Rachel, you got anything to add? I don't think so. Good. Okay, so why hold an open house? <clears throat> so most of you guys in this room, raise your hand while you're doing it. Um, the key thing is, a I want to make sure you guys have a mind shift, set, shift. Sometimes we hold open houses because the seller wants us to. They demand it, right? If you're working with a builder, hey, we need to 
you need to be committed to having an open house every every Sunday. You know, that's just part of the game. And then we go to these open houses, and then all of a sudden, we're like, our attitude sucks. Like, gosh darn it, it's Sunday, it's 1 o'clock, I'd rather be watching football, I'd rather be hanging out with my family, I'd rather be at the beach or the lake, I'd rather go Christmas shopping, all those things. So it starts with mindset shift set. Um, so if you have the opposite of that attitude, you have an a open mind, a positive attitude, I'm so excited to go to this open house. And this is the mindset that I always had when I went to open houses. I'm so excited to go to this open house. I can't wait to meet the people that are going to come through. Can't wait to have great conversations with them. I'm going to pick up at least one buyer today. One. That's all I want for this day to make my two hours, my three hours worthwhile. I'm going to pick up one buyer that's going to lead me to a $6,000 gross commission check. So definitely focus on your mindset. Um, service in the seller. So if you have signed up a listing and they've agreed to pay you thousands of dollars to sell their home, it's a service that we should offer, right? It's something that not only should we offer, but it's also something that's going to help us attract buyers. It's going to help us uh, sell the listing. So it is a calling to do an open house, I feel, for all these reasons. Does that make sense? Rachel? I think um, back to the mindset shift, um, I think part of it is just to make it fun. Um, for the first three years, I did every open house every Sunday with my husband. It was like for two hours, he could be there. Well, for safety reasons, obviously, it's like nice to have somebody there. Um, but it was nice, you know, between times when like buyers weren't in there, like my husband and I could have like a few minutes to chat or catch up on the week and then send emails and things like that. Um, then when we had baby, baby came along with us for a few months until they could walk and then that wasn't, I wouldn't advise that, but it was fun. It was like kind of a family affair. We did it every Sunday. We'd go out for breakfast before, go set up our open house and we'd have that two set hours, three set hours every week to spend time together. And if somebody didn't come to the open house and you felt like it was wasted, you still got some quality time with your family um, where you're not sitting in your house watching, I don't know, say yes to the dress or something on Sunday. So that part was fun. If you can't bring a family member, invite one of your favorite lenders to come with you. It's a great way to like establish a relationship with them that's um, outside of the office. Um, and then it also, I think, gives them an opportunity to follow up with on leads as well as you. You've got, you know, twice as many hits for those clients, mm -hmm. potential clients. Yeah, yeah. Any questions on that? Any comments? Anything to add? Okay, so you've got the mindset of holding an open house, so um, how do you make it effective? Selection is the number one key, I feel, of having an awesome open house. You know, price according to your goals. So if you want to work certain markets, if you want to be in the luxury market, the new construction market, the first time home buyer market, you know, make sure you're, <coughs> excuse me, um, picking something that's priced appropriately. Now, I'll be honest with you, that luxury market is, you might not have a ton of people that want to, you know, uh, that don't have an agent over 500, 600, or, or a million dollar um, listing. So maybe it's more beneficial to hit that 225, 250 resale. So think strategically about that. A high traffic area, and we're not saying like on the corner of, you know, University and 22nd Street, more so like a high traffic area that, you know, people want to be. You know, whether it's a certain uh, elementary school district, it's a certain uh, area where it's close to parks and different features and amenities, and then definitely a house that shows well inside and out. You know, that's a key thing. You're using the house as a, a magnet to the point where they see the picture of the front of the house and that curb appeal just is like, you know, really compelling them to get up, get dressed, brush their teeth, get in their car, drive to that open house to come look at it. So you definitely want to pick a house that's just a, a beautiful house. Um, one of our things that we do, um, one of the best open house, well, the best open house, we had 60, 65 people through, and it was an existing home in Windsor Heights, $275,000. Um, we had 60 people through, and we played it up. She was an interior designer. He was a landscape architect. So we would show like sneak peek photos of it. Um, and this was the week that we had it listed. And we could not keep up with like the traffic of like, and that was Windsor Heights. I mean, it was a great area, great price point. Um, another thing I would say too is we make a game out of them. 
um, we had this bar, the set of walls, they had made a bar out of um, beer, what were they? Eggs? No, they were like the labels, like beer labels. Mm -hmm. So we took a picture of that and we had people like guess what our favorite beer, if they could find it. That picture got shared so many times and we had so many people um, contact us whether or not they came to the open house. They have a lot of people that contacted us because this bar was such a neat feature that people reached out to us to, you know, find out more about the house because they liked this one picture. You don't give away everything on social media, but enough to keep their interest, I think really helps drive traffic. Yeah. Yeah. Did you sell the house that day because of 60 people coming through? Oh, we, yeah, well, <laughs> we actually delayed, um, that one was kind of a unique situation. We had 10 <coughs> offers and it ended up selling like $35,000 over Holy at price. Um, so that one was, okay? um, and we took out appraisal and then oh, the, wow. they were fine with it. Yeah, as you said, I need to start calling through right there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, again, that one was just like a, that has never happened to us before. I don't want to say that's like a common thing, but that was a spectacular. Yeah. Uh, and it was a decent price point. I mean, two, I think it was 285 and we sold it at like well over 300. Yeah, yeah. Anyone else have some hot areas that they like to to do? Polk City, is Polk City a pretty high traffic area? I've been killing it in Norwalk. Like this, just, I almost am sad now that we haven't accepted off because I was having 12, 15 people. And, I, and, and I'm talking about <laughs> another one. Are you on this? Are you showing No, but just from that open house, I've got three listings and an accepted off run out. It, it, it's great. Cra Norwalk's crazy. Yeah. That's so that's, awesome. that's where I like to go. Nor yeah. But I otherwise, um, yeah. What I what I'm saying it's a secret. It's a secret. <laughs> I was my mouth so I, I got this listing in all wash out. Anyone in this room, and I'd love to pay you three percent on it. So you know, our home show house. Yeah. It'll be a good three percent. Not after December. Oh, after, well, yeah. Come on. Wait till after December. Rachel's doing a client appreciation party there. So yeah. if anyone wants to do that, you have some more. Optimist, Stop giving away all of our Oh, secrets. sorry. <laughs> Don't take that back. Rewind. <laughs> that idea yeah. Rewind. It's December 7th. It's from Fort and just come on. We're going to all come down. That's not even the date, but I'm sure. I'll be there on the 7th. I'll mess it around. Um, Norwalk's great. Um, you know, Ankeny, I, don't, I haven't done an open house in Ankeny in a very long time, so I don't know yeah. how. Good Randy, have you, you've done open houses at one thing I came through yours. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, price point was like uh, three, uh, three forty, three fifty. That ballpark. Yeah, we probably would average around four. Four. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Melanie, how about you with your uh, new construction? We it's it's hit and miss. So two weeks ago we had four or five couples groups come through, mm -hmm. and last Sunday. Nobody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think it's just the weekends. We just can't. Yeah, we can't. Well, Sunday, was there and anything? I had a town home in Ankeny open as well. Mm -hmm. Nobody. Yeah. It was pretty nice out. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Wait, I it was pretty nice out, wasn't it? Home. I think yeah. part of it is honestly it was daylight savings time on Sunday, last Sunday. Mm -hmm. So I think that yeah. I probably had a bothers people, it's especially nice. if you yeah. have young kids and yeah. Well, there's a lot of things. I think another thing too. There's a lot of things going on Saturday night, and so some of us probably slept in past open house, and you know, you didn't have your kids, and you drop your kids off, and all this stuff. What did you do? I was like, oh yeah, what time in the afternoon? Today. Well, like, I'm 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 this is also important. This is even a lot of what Rachel was talking about. Um, advertise the week before. I think the biggest fail that a lot of us have is putting the open house like the day of the open house. That's you, mm -hmm. you know you're you're just ru Russian roulette, honestly. So try to advertise it the week before. Um, Rachel, I, can I just add something to that? On Zillow and Trulia, we have had several instances of this where we have put scheduled an open house and it's been like two weeks out people do not read the dates and then they show up to your seller's house so if you're doing that i would only do that maybe on the mls but then add zillow and trulia only the week before because yeah. that can be like so pull it from the MLS, mm -hmm. well and i think you can turn them off or edit mm -hmm. them um i just know i mean 
sellers get frustrated, you know, and it's not your fault. The date's clearly on there, but if you only do it a week out, I think that's better. Yeah, I think if you did it like the Monday before right. the open house, yeah. I think that's perfect. And that's a that's enough time to to really start marketing. Because if you do it too early, then all of a sudden people forget about it. And who knows if it's if it's if it's even gonna be available. You know, hopefully you sold it by then. The only time I or the only place I'd advertise week before is on on social media. If you're making an event or something, you mm -hmm. can have that out longer. But yeah, mm -hmm. Zillow and Trulia, mm -hmm. I wouldn't do. Yeah, it's not fun to get a call from your seller with people mm -hmm. showing up and knocking on the door or walking right in or something when they're yeah. home. Yeah, uh, informing the neighbors. We're going to talk more about that, um, and that's back to what we had talked about. You know, even putting out signage. I mean. Your sellers' neighbors have, are now your neighbors. That's the one mindset shift that we also want to talk about. Like, even though you don't physically uh, own the house, um, it's your house while you list it. That's that's your product that you're trying to sell. So, trying to get in with the neighbors because maybe they know a buyer. Maybe they have a family member, a friend, a coworker. Maybe um, they also one day want to sell and. They don't have a, an agent that they're loyal or committed to. They don't have a friend or a family member. And so maybe they are secretly interviewing you based on your performance on that listing. So if you're going, you know, and informing them about open houses, inviting them, engaging them, I think that's a huge leverage tool that you can have. Uh, send notes to sellers with the reminders. Just let you know it's common sense communication. Just say, oh, reminder, we're having the open house this Sunday based on what we talked about. A lot of times that's great stuff that's made. I would make an event. Facebook algorithms have changed a whole lot. If you have an event, it comes to the top of people's Facebook pages. It's easy then to share and invite their friends and neighbors. That's also a great one for them to um, share onto their neighborhood community pages. Yeah. And then the branding, again, goes back to you and yeah. your contact information's on there. Yeah, that's a great tip. Rachel, when you make the event from the business page, mm -hmm. you know that Share My Open House Facebook group? Yeah. So do you connect it to your Facebook event page then like so is that what gets shared because um, with that we don't we don't share um, it on that we'll do our own remax like website pages for that um, I'm talking about creating an actual event From so like page. at home DSM we have our own Facebook page so we'll make yeah. our own event um, for an, for each open every open house has its own event. No, that's what I'm talking about too. But then I'll we don't the, share that onto the share mine. We just will share the page rather than. Somebody that does that event. automatically, don't they? Because whenever I post that, it's like automatically shared. Well, well it has to be part of that group or list or something. Yeah, and I don't sure know. Really I don't know if it's hot. I, I think it's a blender that does. 
I think it's, isn't it Steve Triggerbackers? Mm -hmm. Facebook, or I think it's his. Oh, yeah, added me to it. And, and agents can it. share their own. What page is that? It's, it's called, called Share My, my Open House or Share My Yeah, Share My Open It's not, I mean, yeah, because I'll post all notifications that so and so shared it. I, we don't yeah. use it a whole lot. It's basically only agents that are in that group. So it's a little counterproductive. I, feel. I mean, agents are already going to know about the open house because we have the MLS. So unless, like, the general population is in that group, they're not going to see it because yeah. it's a closed group, I well, believe. So. Yeah, I love Rachel's idea of creating it as a Facebook event because with events on Facebook, there's so many different other ways you can kind of remind people, mm -hmm. touch them. So, and you know, of course, they can say yes, me interested or no. But if they're interested, then all of a sudden, like, just if you're adding more, oh, get ready to bake cookies for the open house, or hey, just look out for these directional signs, or you know, here's the property flyers that we printed up. Just whatever you have that you can touch them, you put it into that Facebook event, and then all of a sudden, it just becomes continual touches and reminders about the event. And then to add on to that, um, through Facebook, whether you're doing it as an event or you're doing it as a post. I definitely think you should boost it. Like you should boost it and pay to advertise that open house to try to get your net out as far as possible. And I think Facebook is just really economic. I mean, you pay five bucks, fifteen bucks, twenty-five bucks, and all of a sudden you're getting um, a lot of paid um, paid impressions. And for that, we boost our events, not the website. For does that make sense? So the event page that we create for our open house is what we boost. We'll do $5, um, and then we just generally will do it like a Thursday or Friday through the Sunday. Mm -hmm. So we don't do it a very long extended amount, but I mean, thousands of people see it. Yeah. And then a video invite. I know uh, Angie, you've been doing a lot of videos, and that's the one thing. I, and I do want to preface video as far as like mm -hmm. how you do the video. We talked about that. Sometimes you, know, you get agents, and it's just like them in front of the house, and which is fine. But it's one of those things too. I think you don't make it too much about yourself. Turn it to the house, just because then all of a sudden we get some agents not in our company that it's just you know they're like a walking selfie, you know. And so just kind of use your taste, use your judgment. But then also we talked about not doing the whole house. Do you want to leave? Don't give away the yeah. What don't is give that? Away the, show. the farm or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, you want a reason for these people to come out. If you're doing a video tour of the entire house. Why are they going to come out to the house when they've just seen the entire house? I still like, yep, I still like the idea of picking a really awesome feature or two, whether it's location, awesome like theater room, view, whatever it is, and really highlight one or two specific features to entice buyers to come out because they want to see more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then back to the whole uh, you know, neighbors too. Don't forget about expired listings for sale by owners in the area, just another way to make another contact. So, you know, like we talked about, the goal is sell the listing. The other goal is to pick up buyers, but then the third goal, um, and not in any special order, is pick up more sellers. So if there's expireds that didn't sell for whatever reason, whether it was price, condition, um, if there's for sale by owners that are trying to sell, you know, definitely reach out to them. We've got some really great for sale by owner tools and tips and tricks, but what I would always do if, if I have a listing in that area, I would definitely reach out to all for sale by owners and say, hey, I'm, I'm Umex, say I'm a, uh, a real estate agent in the area and I've got this listing and uh, I may pick up excess buyers that this house might not be a fit. If I have a buyer that may have interest in looking at your house, are you willing to pay me a commission? Simple question. 50% might say yes, 50% might say no. If they say yes, then we've got the unrepresented seller form. You send it to them. They sign off on it, and then if you have, if that's another hot button that you can provide, if Andrew and Katie are coming through my open house, and I say, hey, you know, I know not just houses that are listed, but I know houses that have been on the market, no longer on the market. I've got an insight on some houses that are you know, for sale by owner that are that might be a good fit, and then I've got some pocket listings, things like that, because they're already able to see all the houses on Zillow or Trulia or Remax.com. But what else can you provide that's a valuable service to hook them in as a buyer? I'd say that's that's 100% key. That's how I focus on it because I don't push myself at all. Mm -hmm. And there's been some people who are like, don't want to talk to, hate realtors, blah, blah, blah. And if you give them that little glimpse of, well, I might know some stuff that's laying on the market. Here's my card. They will call you. 
They absolutely every. I mean, 20 minutes after the open house, I'm getting calls, and it's like, man, this this stuff works. Instead of, hey, give me your name, give me your number, give me your contact information. You know, sign right here. I, you know, it's just it all depends on how you reach that person. I guess. Yeah. And then once they reach out to you, then all of a sudden, you know, that's when you have that sit down meeting where you say, okay, this is who I am. These are my services. This is how I can help you. Before I'm going to show you this pocket listing that I can show to four or the other five people that came through, you know, I'd like to get some sort of commitment from you as a buyer so that I can you know, give you my undivided attention as a buyer's agent. Make sense? Sound pretty good? Rachel, you got any on that? I think that pretty much covers everything on page four as far as preparation. Um, action. So from an action standpoint, you know, Putting out the open houses, signs, we've talked about that. Arriving early, um, maybe even bring in the seller lunch. That'd be a great, you know, how, how memorable would that be? I don't think a lot of agents do that. Or a coffee or a drink or just something, you know, or even like a gift card. If they're going to be, you know, out of their home for the next, you know, couple hours, you know, I'd say first class red carpet service as you give them, you know, some uh, tickets to the movies or just something to, to kind of, Solidify your relationship with them, and then prepare. Make sure they don't have pets if they're going to the movie. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then preparing the home. You know, turn on all the lights, including closets. Open all the curtains, the blinds. Make the house as light and bright as possible. Um, adjust the thermostat to seventy-two degrees. Some you know, some sellers like to keep it cold. Some like to keep it hot. Definitely <laughs> want the house to be comfortable. Uh, burn a nice smelling candle if needed. And then turning on soft music if you've got that as an option, or just bringing music with you if you got a speaker. Yeah, I think all that goes without saying, though, is to check with ask your sellers first if you can. For a candle. Or you know, turn their thermostat and right. things like yeah. that. I, I've never had someone yeah. say no, but still, you want to ask, and then make sure you um, return the house to its yeah. original settings. Yeah. All right. Um, working the open house, you must engage. Oh, can I add one more yeah. thing to that? Bring toilet paper if you're in an, a new construction because you are going to have somebody ask to use the restroom and you're not going to have toilet paper there. Three max branded toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you're going to have a little kid that comes in or somebody, or even, you know, you're sitting in the house for three hours, you might need to use the restroom. Make sure you have toilet paper with you because that gets some. Um, you know, that's one thing about preparation too. Um, just having like an open house uh, box, kit. yeah, kit. Yep. You know, all the things that you need to have, and you know, if it's in the trunk of your car, you got toilet paper, you got your directional signs, you got your. We bring tape. Um, um, we also bring like um, uh, what are they called? The microfiber cloths, um, especially if there's like wood floors, because people track it, and it's just nice to like, you know, clean mm -hmm. up some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, Remove and your shoe paper shine. and then yeah. like a radio or something for music if there's not. Mm -hmm. I'd also recommend a flashlight in case there's a dark basement or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. So yep, uh, getting this is all basic stuff, all physical things. One of the oh, and a hammer. Put those signs in. Yeah, that's another thing. Or have a have a husband or someone handy here for you. <laughs> And a shovel and ice belt. Sorry, I'm just thinking of more <laughs> stuff we keep in our, like as it's winter, we switch out. But like a shovel and um, salt for icy driveways is also something we keep in our car for open mm -hmm. houses. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you do do construction too, make sure you work with the builder or their superintendent. Make sure that you know the driveways shoveled and stoops are shoveled and all that stuff. But okay, work in the open house. You must engage. Greet everyone that comes in. Um, ask them to sign in, build rapport. Um, we're going to talk about tour guide or not. Then we're going to go over some qualifying uh, questions. And then we kind of touch on this a little bit, but providing your value proposition. So, Rachel, do you want to talk about greeting everyone that comes in? Uh, yeah. Greet everyone that's in. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's it's pretty basic. You know, what 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 I always do is I like to meet them at the front door. If I see someone pulling in the driveway, they're parking. I'm starting to get mentally prepared. Uh, prepared. And if I see Melanie and Randy coming in, you know, I got a big smile on my face. I'm gonna make some eye contact. I'm gonna be very welcoming. 
I'm going to shake some hands. If it's some little kids, I'm going to give some high fives. And one thing I really like to do is I like to compliment somebody on something. So if they've got an Iowa State shirt or a Hawkeye shirt or they got, you know, a cute pair of red boots on or whatever, just always find something to kind of, you know, because at that point they're a stranger, you're a stranger. So you just got to have that instance kind of chemistry bring down their, their, uh, their guard. Yeah. And then ask them to sign in. Sometimes there's no right or wrong way to have someone sign in. We do have a sign up here that you guys can all have. Um, thank you, you know, it's electronic copies of this. Thank you for attending our open house for safety and liability reasons. Seller requires all guests to complete a sign in card with the agent on duty. All cards will be included in the monthly draw, uh, Visa gift card drawing. Again, back to kind of like how Rachel was saying that they make their open houses fun and have them. Uh, um, we take back compass. to the front door. Um, or a front window, like, you know, if there's like a glass panel, so that they know when they're coming in that they're going to be expected to sign in right away. It takes a lot of that um, awkwardness of asking them to sign in away because they already have that expectation set up front um, with that. And then, uh, yeah, as far as the, um, oh, and then we also set it on the island or the counter wherever we put it in one of those um, sleeves, you know, that like a standing sign that we set on the counter in front of the registration card. So they've mm -hmm. seen it twice by the time they've get gotten into the kitchen to sign in. Yeah. So, you know, and that's the thing is though that sign is pretty self-explanatory to anyone that comes in and then verbally, of course, we're asking, we're meeting and greeting, shaking hands, you know, um, asking them to sign in. But if they don't sign in at the beginning, um, there's definitely that final pitch at the end. Oh, mine you mind signing in or giving information and then finding something valuable to give them and share them, whether it's, you know, new listings that are, they don't know of yet or buyer agent services, or just one thing that you really picked up that was important to them, which we're going to talk about. Um, but, um, anything else to add on to sign in at all before we go to the report? You do, uh, Rachel, you talk about your cards. Can you do the cards instead of the sign-in sheet? Oh, sure. Yeah, so we actually, um, instead of a registration sheet where everyone kind of line items, uh, we do individual cards so that I feel like if somebody signs in first, they don't fill out in all the information. The subsequent people don't feel obligated to fill in all the information. So we actually take the, um, we cut them into squares, basically, and each person has their own sign-in sheets. And then we tend to get a lot more information filled out. We also ask qualifying questions on that about working with an agent, mm -hmm. timeline, things like that. I feel like people are a lot more open to give that information when it's their own card versus sharing it with other people. And then we take those cards right away, um, and then you can do the drawing off of those. So does it, do all of you do the drawings? I thought you could have it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I said I've never done the drawing. That I mean, you guys are naughty. We do. You do. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. then you just do Facebook advertising and say, "Hey, this person won." So yeah. People are like going through those guys' open house. Yeah. We, yeah, we we've done drawing. We've done like things for the open houses, but yeah, as far as like you know, we don't. I mean, I guess we have for like if we have a lot of traffic through or something. But if there's like one or two people through, you know, we don't. To a drawing for one person. Yeah, we do like once a month. Once a month. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and that's a good way to do it. Is kind of yeah. accumulate that. You know, it's just a, you know creating different ideas, incentives of how to get more traffic. And again, not all people that are coming through are willing and able qualified buyers. But you know, anything that can draw attention to your open house, to use an agent, making that experience great and fun for them, you never know what's going to help you get that buyer to commit to you as an as agent. Well, you know, so with this normal listing of mine, we keep talking about too, like I have people come through open houses at the very beginning when they listed, and they liked the home, but they weren't ready yet because they couldn't buy until the fall and this home won't be here then, and now the home's still here. And so they, you know, so we don't want to, you know, I'm trying to encourage them, I'm just fill it up, whatever, and oh, no, no, we won't, whatever. And now I'm just like, Oh, I mean, I feel like I tried to get them to fill yeah. out the card the way it is. This, I think, it takes a lot of the response. You know, I you make that, it yeah. say, like, it's a liability for the sellers of something. Like, that mm -hmm. kind of puts it back on them, and then it changes their way of thinking versus we're just trying to collect your information to bug you later. 
I think it switches the gears in their head. Lock the door and they can't come in until they've read that side and then you let them in. <laughs> Randy? Do they get templates on those cards that you hand out? Yeah, I'm happy. But, uh, Becca, can I send them to you and you can send mm -hmm. them out? Yeah, it's, yeah, we just print them. We have our own little branding at the top. It would be really easy to do. Mm -hmm. uh, bring that to They're real effective them. because I know the Dreamscape open houses that you've done and sometimes, you know, you guys will show me the... Oh, I was going to say, yeah, this made me think of it too. So if they have their individual cards, as soon as they leave, we jot down notes on the back of it so that we can follow up with them. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not going to remember their kids' names or, you know, a specific school district or, you know, anything that they ask. So we jot notes down on the back as soon as they leave. Um, and then we have that to follow up with the next week. We use those cards too. And what Zach and I tried doing a couple times, and it actually worked, is you give them the card mm -hmm. and then say, hey, while you're, while you're going through, would you put some feedback on here so we can? Yep. And then they're already writing on there. And oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. I love that idea. Feedback on the back, too. Because that's, I love those cards, too, just because it feels more personal right. to them, too. I'm writing that down. Another note, if you do a sign-in sheet, fill out the first person. So the first, the actual first person that comes in doesn't look like they're the first person. I forgot that somewhere. Um, and if you are doing the registration sheets, my suggestion would be to date it and put the address on it so that if you're going through them and you know a month later and you're still doing your follow-ups, you kind of remember what <coughs> house and you can look back on your calendar and see what date that was or something like that because that can help jog your memory unless you have like you know 15 open house sheets you're not going to remember which one was which mm -hmm. yeah and then from there um, we talked about the meet and greet we talked about the logistics of the getting the sign in but then this is probably 80 percent of the most important thing that you're going to do at an open house is building rapport people will you know, if they want to work with you, they got to like you, got to trust you. And so the best way to do that is building that rapport, building that relationship. And so some things that I would say is, you know, where are you guys from? You know, where do you live at? You know, uh, where do you work? Or, you know, where do you like to hang out with? Just getting to know people, chit-chatting. So a lot of times on Sundays, too, they kind of tell you based on what they're wearing. You know, they got a Green Bay Packer stuff on there, they're a Packers fan. So that's one of many ways to build a rapport with them. And then I have an acronym that I like to use. It's called FROG, Family, Recreation, Occupation, and Goals. And so just using one of those letters, now you're not going to be able to talk about all these things, but at least picking something that develops, starts the, the ice to be, you know, broken. Not. Not, yeah. <laughs> and uh, just that, that rapport is, is very important. So having eye contact, using their name, you know, I love using names, Rachel. Uh, you know, once I find out like your name, I'll, I'll say it back to you. As, you know, not overkill, but as much as I think is comfortable. Make sure you make them laugh. That's yeah. how I remember you. Yeah. Make them laugh. You know, one of the things is you know, crack jokes. And if you're not good at cracking jokes, I always say I got the best <laughs> bad jokes ever. Or you know, have uh, you know, self-deprecating jokes. You know, think something that's kind of quirky or, or funny about yourself. And all of a sudden, like, oh, like this, you know. Guy's not full of himself. He knows how to have fun. So having fun, actually, that's that's a great one. Or crying, you know, being having something funny to say. I think focus on being yourself. Because yes, I'm still a newer mm -hmm. agent, but I was mm -hmm. so focused on like this is what I'm supposed to do when I go open house, and this is because we all know I come to every training. But I was so focused on like doing everything that I wasn't being me while I was doing it. Yeah. And now that I'm like, whatever, that's not working for me, and I'm just being me and going with the flow. Mm -hmm. I mean, my conversion is so much better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's awesome. Well, and I think back to the building report, too. I had mentioned that, you know, for the first two, three years, my husband came with me. I'd always, like, crack jokes about, like, you know, oh, drag, you know, realtor life, like, your spouse has to come along, like, stuff like that. And, mm -hmm. you know, my poor husband was always the front of my jokes, but yeah. <laughs> he was, that, you know, and it helps break the ice. And then he can be talking to one of them and, you know, it's just casual when it's not so one on one and salesy. Mm -hmm. That's the worst thing you can do. Yeah, and they get to know you, and I know the clients that we built homes for from, you know, the mm -hmm. open house. They so they love Rachel's personality. It just was like a instant, you know, chemistry thing. Andrew, I would say too, because I always had the problem with, uh, I like to read, try to read people before establishing a conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, my go-to 
it, it's actually kind of funny, is I put five or six flags up in the yard. And so when somebody's walking up, you do the fun, you know, the handshakes, and then you say, so what brings you out? Was it my flags or was it, you know, online? And they're like, you know, they'll say online, and I was like, man, I thought those flags got you. <laughs> I, I tried yeah. to line up, and everybody, they're laughing before they even go through the house. Yeah, that's and a good one. You know, I would say line the whole section out with flag. I, yeah. It works. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. Those tall feather. Open oh, do so you have multiple feather flags? Yeah, I put six out. Oh, that's hilarious. Randy? So did you find uh, buyers a little bit are uh, or will engage better if you have two people there, husband and wife, versus one person? I feel like they do. Um, again, I work with a partner, so I've always had um, a really great experience with having two people because one personality is always going to be more like yours, where the other one's going to be more like you know, the other, like my husband or, you know, Brandon or something. So we always have found that it works works like that. And then my husband and, and, and Brandon are just both, like, much more serious, like, fact-driven people. <coughs> and I'm more like the warmer, like, personality type person. And you bubbly. <laughs> bubbly. But, um, yeah, and that seems to work. And not everybody's going to be, like, attracted to mm -hmm. my type of personality. But then they have my husband there who can, you know, kind of just – talk sports or whatever I'm like I don't know it's football I don't know you know just yeah. kind of do something like that so it works for us yeah and then this one tour guide or not oh so, I will also say too sometimes it's nice when you have a spouse because they might be having a conversation and then they're at, they like will add to my note like my husband will add notes to my open house sheet about something he got out of some, you know, one of the spouses mm -hmm. that I didn't catch because I was with somebody, someone else. I think I have multiple clients at a time to be your assistant. It's so nice. And then he always stands in the kitchen and, you know, invites people in and then, you know, asks them to sign in. But meanwhile, he can kind of have that, like, surface level conversation mm -hmm. while I'm finishing up or wrapping up with another yeah. client who's walked in. Yeah. And I think Rachel nailed it with having it be kind of a family thing, too, because not only has it helped been with from a security standpoint, right? I mean, mm -hmm. unfortunately, that's a true fact in our industry is there are a lot of weird, creepy people out here targeting female agents. So A, having a security, and that's something maybe you can have to go. This is my security guard. Yeah. <laughs> He's really big, too, sometimes. Yeah. He's got uh, a taser. You better side in. He's got a taser. He's going to tase you. Now, say your spouse is not a realtor, there's certain things that they cannot talk Correct. about. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. they can't talk They're about They're definitely it. not there to be an agent. They're definitely more so there to support. To, yeah. I always made the job, like in winter, I hated doing open houses because I didn't like shoveling yeah. and putting the signs up, running through the snow. Like, I would bring him to basically just do that stuff. The He'd husband go out material before. right there. Uh, I would do that. Yeah. <laughs> You can find a partner who can do that. Probably do my it. wife's gonna be out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I mean, it, like I said, it works for us, and we, you know, can make kind of a day out of the Sunday, get breakfast, you know, earlier, or get you know an early lunch, and then you go do this. And mm -hmm. if there's nobody that comes to the open house, you at least still are away from your family for unnecessary. Yeah. We kind of stopped doing that when our kiddo turned one. It was a little harder to. Like he was more of a distraction at that point than a help. Yeah. He's cute, but he'll help some help. Um, yeah, and then tour guide or not. So that's definitely something that we want to talk about. This is there's no right or wrong. When I did new construction open houses every weekend, I think I've told this story before. You know, my first year in business, seventy percent of my um, business came from open houses, and I acted as a tour guide. I would go and kind of. I'm like, I'm not, you know, I'd like to, you know, maybe show you around and show you some of the features, but that actually gave me a time to build rapport, to qualify them, to get to know them, to get them to like me too. But I wasn't like stink on shit, right? I'm not like just hovering over them, but you know, just kind of showing them around, pointing out features. So we kind of talked about that. So definitely there's pros and cons. Do we want to hover? No. Do we want to point things out and engage and qualify and build rapport? Absolutely. So just kind of play it by ear based on the personality. The last thing you want to do is, oh, go ahead and take a look around and you're on your phone the whole time. You're on your laptop or tablet. Oh, what'd you think? Oh, okay, great. See you. Bye-bye. You know, so just use your best judgment. I'm a little more towards the not being a tour guide. I just like to have um, people be able to feel free to wander through the home and look in closets and not feel 
um, uncomfortable, I guess, with me falling. The one time, though, that I always will go with them is if it's an unfinished basement. People have a really hard time visualizing things, so I will go down to an unfinished basement with them every time and um, kind of point out how the layout would be or potential layout could be. Um, but yeah, I tend to not, and we talked, in new construction, so many things are open concepts now, you can always still have that conversation mm -hmm. going with them without following them into yeah. room to room. Yeah, and sometimes they can go upstairs by themselves. You know, sometimes they can, you know, do, you know, a bedroom's a bedroom, you know, but like Rachel says, it's, you know, if it's an open concept, it's kind of easy to point things out and so build a four. But even not playing tour guide, maybe just pop in on them, you know, from area to area, and then that way you can, you know, <laughs> boom. <laughs> but no, just pop, you know, if if uh, I'm hanging in the kitchen and it's slow and I know that, you know, Rachel and mine are looking at the master, I might pop in and say, what do you guys think of the master? And then, you know, the house, you know, is going to sell itself. It's They're either going to like it or they're not going to like it. And so, oh, this is a fiberglass tub. You know, they don't, that's basic stuff. Use that opportunity to say, you know, um, so do you guys live in the area? And actually, we're going to that uh, now. You know, how'd you find the home? You know, how long have you been looking? Um, what sites are you looking on? How's the home search, go search going so far? Where do you live at now? How soon are you wanting to move? Are you currently committed to working with an agent? Uh, what school district do you want to be in? What's your price range? What style do you prefer? So these are a great, a great framework of questions to ask, price range, payments, all that thing. So all those things. So what I would recommend doing is make these questions your own, how you would say them, and then kind of in an order that you're comfortable saying it. And that's also back to that whole mindset, you know, having that positive mindset of going to the open house. I remember like I used to drive 25 minutes from my house to my uh, Glenstone Trail open houses. And I would just kind of, in my mind, kind of do my own internal role playing of questions and dialogue conversations I was going to have with people. And like I said, I mean, my first year in business, 70% of my open houses, or 70% of my business came from strangers, people I had never met before. So definitely, that's important. Role playing it with yourself, your spouse, in a mirror, just because we all think we sound and look great when we talk. But I mean, you really, it is, it is a skill, you know, we are, you know, at the end of the day needing to perform at a certain level to close people, convert them, become proficient. Um, back to the tour guide or not, I, like I said, I don't follow them through the house or any, by any means, but um, mm -hmm. I always make sure to have a question ready for them when they're come, either coming up from a finished basement or downstairs from a second story. Like, again, going back to picking out a feature of the home. So like, hey, what did you think about that huge master shower? Because then it engages the conversation again, so they don't just walk out the door and you don't see them anymore. Yeah, yeah. I love that tip. That's a great tip. And then number eight on your handout, you know, provide your value proposition. This is definitely something that I think you guys should all kind of write down and kind of memorize and practice. But this one is just an example. I specialize in helping clients find the right home in the right neighborhood with the right terms. Is that something you'd be interested in? Why don't we schedule a time to meet for 15 to 20 minutes? This came straight from Momentum. It's kind of a little scripted for me. This wouldn't be my value proposition. I like what Andrew said. When I was really wanting to pick up buyers um, at new construction open houses, I would ask them, you know, because I would qualifying questions. And at the end, I say, oh, by the way, are you currently committed to work on the agent? They might say, yes, I'm working with Lindsay Aaron. Oh, that's a great agent. You're in great hands. They might say no. And I would say, you know what? Um, this is something that I would recommend, and I would love to be your agent, but I would definitely recommend uh, having a buyer's agent. You know, how a buyer's agent get, get, get paid most of the times is through the seller. The sellers already agreed to pay a listing commission, which the buyer agent splits that. By you having a buyer's agent, you're going to be able to have someone purely negotiating on your side. We help uh, search for homes. We help schedule inspections. You know, you, we take it to the homes and just all the things that you offer. But then also kind of given my value proposition, which was, you know, I don't care if it's five houses, 15 homes or 50 homes. I'll take it to any home uh, that you want to look at, making sure that it's that right fit for you. And if it ends up coming back to being this home, great. But if not, you know that's one of the things that I am committed to helping you with, and um, and it's not you're not trying to. You're, I mean, obviously you're trying to get an appointment, but you're not trying to 100% close them as a buyer. What you're trying to do is 
get them to that next step, which is a, a meeting in the office or a meeting somewhere to sit down and take them through your buyer process. The craziest thing that I hear for, and this is just feedback, but the craziest thing I hear from people is make sure you make a note, hey, I can show other real yeah. other company. And they're like, wait, you can show us a century 21 on the street? And it's like, well, yeah. It, it surprises me with how many people, mm -hmm. especially calling on signs, that don't understand that. And well, so I mean, I've got people from open houses just because they're like, oh, we didn't know we could go through all these different people with one person. Well, of course, we, you know, yeah. we want somebody to. Yeah. I think I one did. of the good, the, um, I really like asking if somebody's committed to an agent versus working with an agent because if they've, you know, gone out with one agent one time to go look at a house, they're, they may not be committed to that agent if they don't feel like, I feel like that's a um, yeah. good distinguishing and that really um, kind of changes people's like mindsets too. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right because if you know they might make something up to you, they might say, "Oh yeah, I'm working with you," just to put up their guard and their defenses. But that word commitment, you know, is is a, an important question. Are you committed to working with that agent? And we're not trying to swoop in and steal other people's clients, but if they're just, you know, did a one-time showing and they're not committed to that agent, and all of a sudden you show them the the Rachel Harms, you know, experience, and like, you know, we would love to work with we have with likes. Rachel. <laughs> So yeah, um, but you know, and that's the thing. Most buyers, a, they don't know how you get paid. So by helping them understand how commission works, because all of a sudden they're like, oh, I got to pay you three percent to buy a house. You know, they're not going to do that. Um, and then also, exactly what say Andrew said, I can help you with any house that's on the, the market, but also I can help you with homes that aren't on the market. Also, for sale by owners, you do not want to entertain or get into a contract with a seller. They are not a professional seller. This is probably the first time or maybe less than a handful of times that they've ever sold a house. And all of a sudden you're making a, a very expensive purchase without any professional representation. Can you get a lawyer to help you draw the contract? Sure. What they're going to do is make sure that maybe the I's dotted and T's are crossed on the contract, but are they going to have a good understanding of pricing? terms, conditions, inspections, all those things that are very important for what we do for our clients. So that's a huge uh, thing. You know, people are driven by fear and desire, the desire of wanting to find that dream home for themselves and their family. You have to show how you can help them fulfill that desire. But then also the fear, we don't want to scare them, but the fear of, hey, these are the things that could go wrong when you buy a house. You might buy a house and you didn't inspect it properly, and next thing you know, you got a $12,000 sewer line. I scare people with this story of uh, an actual situation. You know, I went to a, a potential seller and they bought this house for sale by owner and they didn't know that the house was in the flood. Plane. And all of a sudden they had more insurance premiums every year than they ever thought, but they had already been in a legally binding contract that they would have got sued to try to get out. They didn't find out about that floodplain and that insurance until the day of closing. Had they worked with me as an agent, worked with my preferred lenders that would have done a flood certification, they might have known that. You know, so there's definitely lots of things that we know that is proprietary information to to, to what we do that we can share with them. How are we do on time? Okay. Any questions on that at all? So definitely, that's you know one of the biggest takeaways is you know rapport, qualifying questions, and your value proposition because it's going to be your words in the matter of five, 10, 15 minutes at best that you have with them that may lead to a $6,000 commission check. Okay. Moving on to the post open house stuff. Now this is critical too. Um, leave the house, Rachel mentioned this earlier, leave the house just as when you arrived. It, uh, arrived. So if you've adjusted the thermostat, put it back. Then follow up with the seller. There's a few different ways you can inform the seller how the open house went because they're probably dying to know. You can call them, you can wait for them to come home so you can tell them face to face, you can leave them a, a personal written note, you can text them, you can email them. It doesn't really matter which way you do it, but that is part of our services, that's part of your responsibilities to give the seller the feedback of how the open house went, what people said, if they liked the house, what they thought about price, what they thought about condition, any negative, positive feedback, definitely tell them that. And I love Andrew's idea of the feedback on the card because I think that them seeing that directly from someone walking through the house or just like when we do agent opens, having that agent feedback written down, I think that's very, very important, especially if you got a seller that may not be, you know, mentally aligned with what the pricing should be. Um, 
Schedule 45 minutes after the open house for follow up, including agents of represented visitors. Mm -hmm. I think that's critical. You know, just budget that time. So as soon as they're, as soon as the open house is over, you just have an opportunity to either do a follow up, thank you for visiting text, email, or a handwritten card. Um, then definitely add all leads to your database. That is probably one of the biggest things that I see a lot of agents, including myself, fail on. You get people that are, you know, if there's only five people that, five groups that come in and three sign up with legitimate email and you don't follow up with them, then you just wasted everyone's time. You wasted your time, the seller's time. You know, like I said, no one is just gonna say, oh yeah, sign me up, where's the purchase agreement? I wanna buy this house. You gotta follow up with them at least five times, six times, 12 times, right, Andrew? You convert them? A lot. A lot. <laughs> how many How many touches do you do with an open house visitor before they commit to you? Oh, it depends. I mean, it's all about reading people. If one, they're going to be paying the butt and I know they don't want to talk to me, I'm, I'm letting them go. Mm -hmm. I mean, my people are, the people I've converted are, you're not like hey, we love you. Like, you're awesome. Mm -hmm. Like, we're not an agent. Work. And that's when I'm, yeah. hey, I'm going to go show you this house. Because my thing is, if I get in front of them in mind, yeah. So if I at least you know keep in touch or send an update once a week or once every two weeks, mm -hmm. there's no reason I should lose them. Yeah. There's no reason. Yeah. I love that um including agents of represented visits. I think that's a great <laughs> key tool that people miss out a lot on. Um, if you get their agent's name, I always send an email to the agent. I said, hey, just want to let you know that Bill and Kelly just came through my open house. They were great. Like, um, you know, let me know if you have any questions about the house. Because the agent might not know that they were there, and then it also gives um, mm -hmm. you a reason to follow up, and then that agent is then following up with, you know, that's like two more touches for those people about that open house. Yeah, and another thing about that, too, agents that you, when you reach out to them, they're going to appreciate that. Absolutely. Like, you know, Rachel, and they return the yeah. favor back to you, because you don't always know when your clients are going out on Sundays. You know, I like to hear from the agent. If my clients went through the house, I think that's great. And then it gives me a chance to touch base with my clients again. Mm -hmm. It's just a win-win. And it makes, I feel like, for a smoother, if you if a deal does get put together, you know, agents are already on happy terms with each other. Yeah, yeah. And that's the name of the game, too, is relationships. So just like having relationships with your database, with new people, having a relationship with our fellow agents is very important. All of a sudden they can say, yeah, I've worked with, Melanie, before she's a great person, great agent. You know, I think um, this will be a great, you know, transaction. So if more agents do that, it might be less like <laughs> cutthroat. Yes. <laughs> Anything else on that, guys? Any suggestions? Any ideas? Any questions? On post open house. I got a, I got a qu question for the during the open house. I know you guys kept mentioning like cookies and stuff. <laughs> Every time I've done like cheese and crackers or cookies or wine or what, it's a it's pointless. Nobody takes it. Nobody. I think it's do you the do mindset. Stuff? Um, we have yes, and I think it depends on the situation. So if it's a morning open house, absolutely bring mimosas, but have one yourself. Like okay. people don't like to be the only ones that take something. So you know, like I mean, don't get drunk at an open house or eat all the cookies or something. But you know, have a drink and then people oh, are more. Eat all the cookies. Yeah, <laughs> people are more. I feel like more inclined to take something if they have kids. Ask the parents first. Being a mom, like I don't like when people just offer food. Like, ask the parents first. Like, hey, can you know, little one have a cookie or a snack? Or Not those kids will they take those, peanuts. and then the parents are like more likely to take. I think you just have to be more inviting with it. Yeah, get them, and then also gets them a chance to sit down at the island or the kitchen table, and um, you know, that just gives you more time mm -hmm. to. I have with them, or you know, having kids' activities there too. Like when we do our home show houses, coloring books, yeah, little toys, whatever. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Because mm -hmm. then the kid, you know, if the kids are being distracting, the parents aren't looking at the house. If they, you know, leave the kids with you in the kitchen for a few minutes while they go run through the house. I'm thinking great. concepts, coloring books with my, my picture just yeah. yell in my face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I mean, coloring books and crayons are great. Just make sure they're not coloring on the walls of somebody's right. house. Yeah. I didn't bring them, but for home shows, you know, we do uh, a home show is pretty much a mega open house, right? But we have coloring books, we have stickers, we have balloons. drinks, balloons, all that fun stuff for the kids. It's all for the kids. Is that like a three hour on a, it's on a Sunday? 
Yeah, the, well, I mean, the show. home show is, oh, yeah. is more than 10 hours, like uh, three hours. It's like, hours. Hours. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we start at, uh, I think we start at 9 or 10 and go all the way till 6 okay. or 8 or 9 that night, so. I also think it's good to have um, waters available. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I've gotten so many people come through and they're like, we've been going through houses all day and like nobody has had anything to drink. Mm -hmm. So if you bring a handful of waters mm -hmm. to, yeah, that's good, yeah. to yeah. throw in. Yeah, we had Dreamscape water bottles. I mean, yeah, it's super easy to throw a label on a water bottle with your branding again. Yeah, and this is um, this is taking open houses to the next level. This is all in your information too. We're doing what, what, 1221, so we're running short on time. But holding a mega open house, this is something that you invite the whole neighborhood to. Um, so you're having a neighborhood party. It's a you get together. It's by invitation. It's a sneak peek, and it's pretty much a luncheon before the open house. So if you've got like for instance, Lindsay, you're listing in Norwalk and you want to do this mega open house with the goal of getting the open house exposed to the neighbors, but then also getting to meet potential sellers. Um, you invite them, uh, have maybe a theme party. I mean, Rachel and I were joking about this yesterday. We were talking about, you know, like million uh, million dollar listings. They always have it. People get crazy with their yeah, they they are people, yeah. But, yeah. Um, and then teaming up with other agents in the neighborhood, we talked about that too. If you're in a neighborhood and there's four other concepts agents or even outside brokerages holding a neighborhood open house event. Would you do this on a resale then? Mm -hmm. So question. Oh. Absolutely on a resale. Right. So question though, do you, and this could be stupid, but let's say you're grilling out and doing a lunch or whatever. So then you allow the seller to be there. Yeah, yeah. At the beginning. Is that okay? Before the open house starts. Okay. With before the, the open house starts. Like with okay. the neighbors. Okay. And then your actual open house starts one of you wrap it up and has your business selection. Okay. Okay. Exit. That's yep. pretty good. That's that's a pretty good idea. Yeah. Especially in a resale because then all of a sudden even if like they're in a little cul-de-sac or a block of four mm -hmm. or five houses. You're inviting them, invite them over, and oh, this is my agent. This is exactly. Uh, you know, this is Randy. Yeah. Okay. You know, my agent. He's awesome. Work with if you guys are ever wanting to sell after we sell first. You know, this is who you should work with. And but like team, I mentioned, that neighborhood associate. If they have a Facebook page, they've already been sharing that. Then they meet you in person. They see you're doing this like angel. I mean, that's like three spectacular like touches for you with these uh, potential sellers down the road that you didn't have to do anything for. Yeah, yeah. Um, do more advertising, start earlier. Um, you know, uh, another, some ideas too, we had, you know, open houses, most people do them Sundays, sometimes Saturdays, but also thinking about maybe um, twilight type open houses, happy hour type. I mean, I, I, I'm doing a happy hour just to see what mm -hmm. kind of it's hit or miss. Depend. I mean, obviously, as winter with daylight savings oh, time, okay. it gets darker earlier. Um, but we've had good luck with um, if you have a location near like Jordan Creek Mall or you know Ankeny mm -hmm. Shopping Centers, people are at holiday shopping. If you throw up a sign, you know they might just like swing by if they're mm -hmm. out shopping anyway. You know to, to come in yeah. and, and. I check think if out. you have a theme and you have a purpose, purpose and a really strong call mm -hmm. to action on the happy hour ones, I think it's. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Yeah. But I have an idea for you. I used to do this um, when I was a new construction agent with Jerry's Homes. We used to do uh, Thursday open houses at um, a townhome development called Silver Oak, and we would actually call them um, first-time buyer seminars. Oh, yeah. That was our target buyer, right? And so all of a sudden, like, hey, we have it's happy hour. We've got snacks. We've got drinks. Come to network. Come to learn about how you can you know, buy your first home. We've got kits and lenders there and all that stuff. And so all of a sudden like, you know, yeah. they might go they, they may not want that town home or that condo or that house, but all of a sudden it's another reason why you're bringing them there. Thinking about bringing my dad's food truck to one. I think that's a great idea. Well we, we, talked about we that. actually yeah. have talks about that. If you get a neighborhood yeah. one, I mean a food truck has so much following and advertising uh -huh. on social media. If you can get a business Especially your dad's to yeah, share right. your yeah. open house. Oh you guys know how good. Yeah. I think that first time home buyer open house would be cool, especially if you get like, you know, I don't know what the average first time home buyer is buying anymore, like 180, 190. I don't even care. Yeah. 100,000, I'm happy with yeah. that. Yeah. Um, other than that, um, let's see here. We got, oh, we got some examples. These are some examples that we found There's online. Truck. Yeah. No. Um, pizza, beers, and real estate. No. 
kick off a barbecue season with the Suarez theme. So these theme, well, this one's fun. I thought my kids, my kids would love that one. The Kona, the, you know, those, um, whatchamacallit? Slushies. Slush, yeah, ice cones, snow cones. Um, so we talked about the themes of uh, progressive dinner ideas, scavenger hunts, giveaways. We talked about giveaways. Uh, earlier, um, and I think we're missing the boat if we're not leveraging other partners, you know, lenders, vendors. They want to be in front of the same people that we want to be in front of. And then from a preparation standpoint, do all the standard things that you're doing already for open house, but then focus on getting the word out maybe one to two weeks ahead if you're doing that mega open house, invite the neighbors, and then definitely send out the invitations via mailings and or door knockers, and then definitely have the help uh, the sellers help promoted, especially since they're moving out of the neighborhood, maybe they can tie it in as like kind of maybe a potential going away party. Any questions on mega open houses at all? I think the last pages are like the scripts we have mentioned yeah. that are. Yeah, there's a lot of um, really good tools and resources. So page eight, visiting five to 50 neighbor dialogue, welcoming dialogue, they're out looking at open houses dialogue. Not a buyer sample dialogue. These are like the industry best dialogues that we've kind of combed the internet, right, Rebecca? Not currently ready to buy dialogue on 11. But yeah, I mean, just to kind of wrap this up, I mean, final thoughts. We said earlier, you know, make open houses part of your pillars. I mean, even if you're converting at that 10%, you're doing 45 a week, you know, 60,000 extra a year. 45. Yeah, 45 a year. <laughs> Do you track them? I mean, do you? Because I think I'm a. I track them. Definitely them. track them. Just to track see it. We'll yeah. talk about it next year. Yeah. yeah. On how close. Well, and I think 45. Um, we had mentioned this too. It doesn't have to be every Sunday. I mean, the 45 can consist of agent opens. It can consist. I mean, obviously that you're not picking up buyers, but. No. I mean. There's a lot of yeah. open house opportunities that aren't the traditional Sunday one to four sitting in a in yeah. a house. Yeah. Make it fun. Involve your family. I think that's awesome, and I an awesome idea. Or involve friends too. I think that's a great idea. Um, you know, have the girls mimosa thing at your open house, and they can kind of see you in action, and you can hang out with them. Make it memorable. Definitely think about security. This this is listing one on one. Make sure everything's locked up. Medications, jewelry, electronics, things like that. And then also kind of think about how do you double up if you're already committed to doing an open house. You know, instead of a one to four or one to three, maybe the ten to twelve, maybe the ten and twelve. Give yourself an hour break and then go two to four, and all of a sudden you got two open houses oh, yeah. that Sunday. Do you do that or? I'm gonna try hitting four in a couple weeks if yeah. the weather's nice. Just I think ten to twelve would be a huge market because we were talking about this. A lot of people that um, go to church, if they go home, they might not come back out. If they can just swing by an open house on the way home from church or brunch or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. you might pick up some of those yeah. potential buyers that wouldn't have yeah. come out at all had it been later. Yeah, and then some links that we have that you guys have physical copies of, a sample sign-in sheet, follow-up notes, sample open house front door sign, and a thank you notes template. So, and I'll share my cards, my sign-in cards with Becca. We can send them out to you guys if you want um, to use those for buyer checklist. I think I oh, so, oh, yeah. And, and this was a, a buyer checklist. This is actually great for not just open houses, but your buyer presentation. Yes. This is what we use for, to follow up with buyers. Um, we'll send that out, whether it's email or you know, if you can schedule an in-person meeting with a buyer appointment. That's a great way to help narrow in their mm -hmm. search. Yeah, I love it. I mean, that's if you're doing, if you're working with buyers, it's very, very important to fill that out for every single person that you're working with. And actually, if you have a husband and wife or a boyfriend, girlfriend, they can both fill that out. Um, then all of a sudden, you know exactly what you're looking, what they're looking for. You know, there's a lot of things like, hey, do you want a fireplace? Is a formal living room important to you? A formal dining room? The more you know about what your buyer is looking for, the faster, the easier, the better you're going to help them. But I think that's it. What time is it? Drop down. Oh, oh. 30. Yeah. yeah. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> How about you? We're online. Two? Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>